In this video, we're going to talk about some different perspectives on group actions, uh, group actions we introduced in the previous video. So first of all, just as a reminder, the definition of group action was a group action, left group action, of a group G on a set X is a function. And this time, instead of calling it F, I'm just going to call it period, because we were calling the operation period earlier. Period from G cross X to X with these properties. So number one, the identity acting on X had to equal X for every X in the set. And number two, GH acting on X had to equal the result of G acting on the result of H acting on X for all X and for all G and H in the group. So in this perspective, we think of a group action as a function from ordered pairs of element of G comma element of X to element of X. But also in the video, we, we really didn't talk about group actions that way very actively. We talked about group actions as though each group element is a function which does something to X. So here's another perspective. Given a group action of G on X, Each element of G acts as a permutation of X. Now we didn't prove that in the previous video. And if we just took any function from G cross X to X, it wouldn't be a given that each group element actually permutes elements of X. So this is something that we might want to show, want to prove. that for every G in our group, the function that maps X to G acting on X is a permutation of X. That is a bijection from X to itself. So let's see if we can prove that. So let's let G be an element of G. And let's define a function name for this for this function here. Let's define sigma sub G from X to X by sigma G of X equals G acting on X. And we will prove sigma sub G is bijective. It's one to one and on two. All right, so to prove that it's one to one, let's suppose X and Y are in X such that Sigma G of X equals Sigma G of Y. And we'll show that X equals Y. All right, well, to do this, uh, since we know sigma g of x equals sigma g of y, since we know that, that means g acting on x produces the same result as g acting on y. But now <clears throat> I can use the fact that I have these composition rules for group actions. Let me just zoom out a bit so we can still see those. There we go. So I'm going to take each side of this equation here and act on each side with G inverse. So G inverse acting on G acting on X has to be the same as G inverse acting on G acting on Y because G acting on X and G acting on Y produce the same elements. Thus, by our composition rules, G inverse G acting on X equals G inverse G acting on Y. 
Great. And that means that the identity acting on X equals the identity acting on Y, which means at last that X equals Y. So sigma G really is one to one. In other words, with any group element, the action of that group element on the set X is a one-to-one -one function. It has to map different elements of X to different elements of X. And the reason for that basically is that whatever we map to, if we, if we map with a certain element of G, whatever we map elements of X to, they have to be able to come back when we act on them with G inverse. So if they all have to come back to their original states, then that means that we couldn't have sent two elements of X to the same thing. All right, what about showing that sigma G is onto? Well, let's suppose that Y belongs to X. Then we want to show there is some element X belonging to X such that sigma G of X is equal to Y. In other words, we want to show that we can arrive at Y by acting on some element of X with G. And as always with this kind of proof, I want to come over here and do a little work in the margin. So I want to find some X such that G acting on X gives me Y. All right, I have to, so the G is given here. I can't pick the G. I need to pick an X such that X will be mapped to Y by the action by G. All right, well, let's see. What would, what would that make X equal to? Or what, what does X need to be equal to in order for us to arrive at Y? Well, I could probably solve this by acting on each side with G inverse. G inverse dot G dot X has to be the same as G inverse dot Y. And then using my composition rules, I get that G inverse G dot X is the same as G inverse dot Y. So I think since that means the identity acting on X gives G inverse dot Y, that means X needs to be G inverse dot Y. And if this feels an awful lot like a proof that we've done before, you're, you're basically right, because what we have here is G acting on elements of a set. And the previous time that we did this, we were thinking of the action of G by left multiplication on elements of a group. So the only thing that's changed here really is we've stopped thinking of X and Y as elements of a group. They're just set elements. Uh, and what's going on over here is still a group operation. So it's really the same proof. It's just when we did the proof the first time, we didn't need very much for X and Y to be group elements. So anyway, we're going to pick X to equal the result of G inverse acting on Y. So then sigma G of X is equal to G acting on X, which is the same as G acting on G inverse dot Y, <clears throat> which by our composition rule, that's the same as G G inverse acting on Y. And that's the identity acting on Y, which is Y. And that's what we wanted. So that means sigma G is on two and thus a bijection since we already showed it's one to one. All right, great. So this means each element of our group induces a permutation of X. Put that in a big box because that's a huge, huge revelation there. Because now I get to say something else. And this is the third perspective I want to share. So the first perspective was just the definition, which is a group action is a function on ordered pairs of group element and set element that maps everything to a set element. The second perspective was that each individual group element is a permutation of X. And now the third perspective is sort of looking at the same thing globally. So this perspective is a group action is a homomorphism of G into the symmetric group on X.
Now, here's an important note. It needn't be a one-to-one -one homomorphism. Different group elements do not have to act in different ways. So just as an example of that, let's suppose that G is the group of integers. And let's say X is the set containing one element, which is my cat Fred. Okay, my cat Fred is not exactly uh, physically active. Fred just pretty much sits there and is Fred all day. So the group action, the way the group action is going to work is that G acting on Fred is Fred for every G in the group. <clears throat> now, every group element does induce a permutation of this set, but it's the identity permutation every time. In cycle notation, it is just the, the length one cycle consisting of Fred. So in this case, the homomorphism is mapping every element of this huge group, this infinite group, to the identity permutation. So just to illustrate that the homomorphism being induced here is not necessarily one-to-one. -one. It's not necessarily even interesting. It's not necessarily non-trivial. But sometimes you do get something kind of interesting. So here's another example of a group action. I'm going to draw a square. And label the vertices 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I'm going to have D4 act on the square, or act on the set of vertices, rather, by performing symmetries on the square. OK, so for example, if I select the symmetry H, reflection across a horizontal line, then H does the following to vertices 1, 2, 3, and 4. It sends 1 to 4, and 4 back to 1, and sends 2 and 3 to each other. And then we can develop a group action in this way. So for another example, R90 would send 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 back to 1. So R90 acts as a 4 cycle on the vertices 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right, so this is an action which gives me a homomorphism of D4 into S4. It's not going to be on 2 because D4 has only 8 elements, while S4 has 24. So we won't get all, we won't get all different permutations of 1, 2, 3, 4 this way. Uh, just for example, the permutation that maps 1, 2, 3, and 4 to say 1, 3, 4, and 2 is not going to be possible with this action because I'd be sending the adjacent vertices 1 and 2 to the non-adjacent vertices 1 and 3. So this will not be in the image of this homomorphism. It won't be the action or the permutation induced by any element of D4. But what is kind of remarkable about this is that earlier when we talked about the left regular representation of D4, that gave us a homomorphism into the symmetry group or symmetric group on D4, which is really just S8 because D4 has eight elements. So now what we have is a much tighter homomorphism of D4 into a symmetric group on four elements. And sometimes that'll be useful for us to have.